Good evening and welcome to the Walter Reed Theater and to this continuing screening and part of our 50th year anniversary tribute to the New York Film Festival, which we're showing uh, classics uh, that we were, had the chance to present here in the festival. Although I think people very often connect the festival with international cinema, indeed I think especially in the 70s the festival played a, a great role with a lot of new American cinema. Mean Streets, uh, The Last Picture Show, Badlands, all premiered at the festival and add to that number the wonderful film you're about to see. It's a film that the uh, producer, Paramount, actually had to be convinced to allow the festival to show because it didn't really know what else to do with it. But uh, we're very glad that in the end uh, my uh, forebearers in the festival were able to do that and the film went on to really be a much loved classic. And we're delighted to have here to present it a great friend of the festival and the Film Society, Jonathan Demme. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. That's, uh, and thank you for coming. Um, uh, like, uh, Citizens Band as a phenomenon, uh, uh, some of you may remember, if you're my age, was like a real thing that was going on in the country <laughs> in, the, in the late 70s. It was a big deal. And we made this movie out of it, and Paramount thought it was going to make a fortune because um, uh, they thought everybody was going to come out and see the Citizens Band movie. But instead, what they discovered to their horror, uh, to our shared horror, that, that CBers were like home on their radios. You know, they didn't go to the movies. So um, it was amazing to, uh, I had uh, moved to New York in, in the mid 60s and I was a fierce attendee of all the New York film festivals. And um, to have, have, the, have my film invited to be in the New York Film Festival, I still haven't gotten over it. Um, and that extends to tonight, many years later. Um, you know, we're, we're here to watch it again. I'm so grateful that you came. And I know Paul and Matt's gonna be here after the screening. Um, Paul's the star of Citizens Band and also Melvin and Howard that we made together a few years later. So um, I guess we're gonna talk um, with you, Richard. Great, so I hope that you're able to stay for that. And again, thank you so much for the welcome and thank you for coming to see Citizens Band. Hope you enjoy it. Everyone, please welcome the director and star of the film, Jonathan Demme and Paul Lamatt. I talk too much when I drink coffee, so I got half and half, decaf and regular. <laughs> I know it's strange, but I'm from option. California. So. <laughs> Let me start off if I can. Jonathan, you came to Handle with Garrett Citizen Band after three films with Roger Corman. Can you talk about that transition from Cormanville to Paramount? And what were the different cultures like? Well, the, the Corman movies were were, you know, had their, their formula um, as much as anything. I mean, they were, they were defined by the fact that they had, you know, like a lot of action, they had nudity, uh, they had humor, uh, they, had, they had like all the ingredients, as much as possible with all these ingredients. And, um, you know, it was fun working with those formulas. You know, I grew up on them as a, as a kid going to the drive-in. And then when I got the script for Citizens Man, um, it was one of the things I loved about it was that there was no violence, there was no nudity. There, you know, there's all this stuff. There were just these great characters. Also, I had been saddled with scripts that I had written uh, for my Corman movies. That's how I got to direct them, um, package deal. And now suddenly here was this wonderful screen with these great characters. And I had, um, you know, was a big Paul Lamatt fan. And uh, the casting started with, with Paul very picky actor, and I think he liked the, <laughs> the kind of the, the off formula thing as well, I think. And, um, you know, it, it all started there, and uh, it, was, it was quite an experience. It, it, it got very complicated after that because, you know, the stu there was all kinds of studio stuff and the studio, st the, 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 the administration that 
had green lighted it or lit it or what have you, got fired just as we finished our movie and a whole new gang came in. And um, also our producer, uh, the late Freddie Fields, um, just it was the first time he had produced a movie and he wanted to change everything. But luckily the way we shot it, we didn't give them too many opportunities to change things. We shot it the old fashioned way where like, this is the coverage, there is no coverage. Um, so that was, that was really it. And it was the first time I ever really got the chance to work with amazing actors like Paul and, and Marsha and Anne. And, and I learned so much about working with, with actors then. One of the things I learned with Paul was if, if I had an idea after take one and I thought it was worth, you know, I still was trying to figure out what a director did. It was only my, my fourth movie. So I, I learned because Paul, t like, so I'd go over and I'd, I'd tell him an idea and then I'd stand there waiting for some kind of like response, like, okay, I'll, okay, I'll do that. And Paul was just like, <laughs> look at me like that. <laughs> I have come to understand that means I'm creating a character here. No, no, no. And you can fertilize me with no, a little something, but then get out of my face. I'm not here to talk with you. I'm here to... Oh, no, you're remembering somebody else. <laughs> I wouldn't do that. I, I absorb what the creative people say, and I incorporate that into my performance. Although it is true, actors, we prepare uh, for what we're going to do, and we have a certain mindset because of it. So when somebody makes a suggestion, it just takes a while, that's all. And then we go ahead and do it. Paul, talk a little bit about working on the film, and especially, I mean, it's such a rich ensemble piece with so many different parts going. What's it like to work in that piece? Were you aware of everything going on? That, not really, but that's great because you have more days off. And, <laughs> you, and you can relax and study your lines. And the director, though, however, he has to be there every day, which I feel sorry for them. Uh, like George Lucas in American Graffiti, he had to work his butt off. And a lot of us weren't wor working on certain days because the movie had different uh, segments with different characters in it. So we got to rest, and he, he, was ex he lost a lot of weight. I'm serious. You could see the weight he lost. Jonathan didn't lose any because he has always been thin. But uh, I w he, he, uh, both George Lucas and Jonathan Demme, have a, uh, at least at that time, they, they wanted rehearsals. And uh, in movie making, uh, especially if it's not a big budget, you don't have time to rehearse. But uh, they took the time to do it, and I I loved it as an actor. We all appreciated that. Remember, we go to the sports coach and rehearse, and uh, then we had the scenes down before we even shot them. I, I would like to say that it's it's. Yeah, I remember we did some rehearsal, and and uh, it's funny because I think one of one of the things that I love so much about your acting, and I loved it on the set uh, when it happened, and I love it uh, in the finished films. Is 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 the unrehearsed stuff that you do in the moment. Stuff that I don't think is, I think it's beyond rehearsal. Uh, it, uh, you know, your, your ability to like get lost in the moment and really, there's like, what, just watching tonight, there were so many things that I was just like, just remembering how dazzled I was at the time, you know, like the. Oh, thank you, Jonathan. You know, is your mic working? And I don't think it's working. Everybody can hear him though. <laughs> Yeah, um, what did you just say? Could you repeat that? <laughs> repeat that? He just liked what you said. I know, it was a compliment. Yeah. yeah, I try to be real. You know, I studied acting here in New York a long time ago. And they were teaching to be real. It's kind of the, the method, acting. And so sometimes the scenes are realer than in other times. Sometimes I feel like I'm acting. Sometimes I, I really believe the person in front of me is a character. Um, it's not so much what the other person is doing, it's just sort of whether you can concentrate enough to, to um, feel like you're right there in that moment talking to that person or listening to that person. And interesting things come out of that because you're, like uh, the next movie is Melvin and Howard, you know, Jason Robarts plays Howard Hughes and he was injured and I picked him up in my car and truck and, and he, I was this, Melvin char character was real enthusiastic about things. So I would hit him sometimes when I was talking to him. 
and uh, I hit him a, cu a couple of times. Yeah, Jason would go, ah, because he's supposed to be injured. And I thought, that's brilliant. The guy is. But, but Paul Melvin would laugh <laughs> at yeah. that. Ah, he, <laughs> that yeah. was kind of this whole thing going back and forth. Well, that's true. Well, they'll see that if you stay for that movie, you've got to watch Jason Robarts. He was great to work with. Was there much improvisation on the set? There is some, but you know, you do have a script and you do have producers who sort of want it to be basically what they wrote or what is written. So, uh, but, if, but if you have a creative director, uh, you can improvise and they'll go, hey, that's beautiful. Or no, let's, let's try that again. So yeah. they can, they'll keep it if they like it. If not, you don't have to worry about it. So. I was just thinking about, about the casting for Melvin and Howard, which kind of, it's, it was an interesting kind of Hollywood situation because um, I got sent that script and um, I was you know, so anxious to work with Paul again because I had really enjoyed the experience and thought the results were terrific. And I read Melvin and Howard and I just went, oh my God, you know, this is a fantastic uh, script. It's a great, great script. It wound up winning the Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. A fantastic script. And I imagined that if we had Paul Lamatt as Melvin and Roberts Blossom, who, who played Papa Thermodyne, that this would be, you know, a fantastic combination. Indeed, it would have been. One of the things I love, I think Roberts Blossom, of course, is a great actor, but he, um, he also was not very well known so the kind of that mysterious aspect of Howard Hughes could be served that way. So anyway, what I discovered was that the studio had been, they hadn't closed any deals, but they were negotiating with Gary Busey for the part of Melvin and with Jason Rovards for the part of Howard. You, you know this. <laughs> like, uh, and then, uh, and I was like, well, there's no way that I want to work with that cast. You know, that this is what directors are supposed to have very strong opinions. I want to work with Paul and Roberts. So what came, excuse me, what came back was they, they said, they negotiated and they said, well, we like the Paul Lamatt idea. That's great. But we insist on Jason Robards because he's, you know, Jason Robards. And, um, you know, take it or leave it. So I was like, hmm, because I love the script and here, here was this opportunity. And, and as I hear myself tell this, it sounds so ludicrous that I was like, hmm, Jason Robards. <laughs> so, um, so they say, look, why don't you meet Jason? Uh, and, and you guys can talk, and then you can make your mind up. So I said, okay. <laughs> you know, like, what, a, what an asshole. You know? so I said, okay. So we, we met at um, a French restaurant uh, for a, a uh, for a, a non-alcoholic drink uh, that that uh, that Jason had chosen, and um, I went in there uh, to meet him, and um, he, he's I sit down. And he goes like, "Hey, how you doing?" And he said, "He said you really should cast me in this part because my middle name, because uh, uh, because uh, Howard Hughes's middle name was Robard, mm -hmm. right? Howard R. Hughes. He said, so they, they're alone. You should cast me." And he says, I know you want this Blossoms guy. He's terrific. Uh, and I know the kind of jam you're in. <laughs> you know, and I was like, <laughs> I know, so I'm like, uh, you're like, and there's Jason Robards now. You know, and I'm like, oh, God, you know. So um, uh, obviously, I made the correct decision. And um, it was, it was, it, it, it worked out very well. In fact, I think, yeah, yeah, it just worked out so great. I, I, I love that film and I love the experience of making it. And, um, Roberts would have been fabulous. Oh, he would have been great. He was a great actor, and he helped me a lot. In the, it's got two titles, Handle with Care or Citizen's Band. Take your pick, because it's had two titles. Can you if, tell us about how that happened? You, how did you get two titles? I don't really know, except, I mean, if you go on IMDb, that, uh, that has uh, sites for all c movies, you'll see it's under Handle with Care. And uh, I think it was Freddie Fields who thought, uh, that Citizens Band, he maybe did some research, I don't know, but he said that it, the title wasn't bringing in the audience like we'd, we'd hoped. They, they, he thought that there were, since there was, it was a big CB craze going on in the 70s, and he thought they'd just flock to the theater. But I guess they're too busy talking on their radios to go into a movie, so he decided to change the title. And I remember Jonathan and I, were, and everybody was trying to come up with a title, but that's what we ended up with. Jonathan, I think the 
the version at the New York Film Festival that was different than the release version, wasn't it? Well, what happened in a nutshell was, that, and there was, a, there was that other thing that I'm just remembering, this extraordinary thing that happened in, in, in New York, exhibition. Um, okay, so the film, um, the new regime um, didn't like the film at all. They thought it was ludicrous. The new head of production actually looked at the old um, head of production and said, what have you people been smoking here? This is the, the transition moment. Um, <laughs> then Barry Diller saw it, they sh who was the head head, who hadn't, uh, he saw it at a preview out in the valley that went very well, and Barry Diller loved it and said, no, we should, we should release this picture, it's very good. Then they kind of like were vacillating and they were doing test screenings and it was, and, and um, the New York Film Festival uh, invited the film to be part of, of uh, uh, the festival that year. And um, I think Paramount was a little resistant, but, but they agreed to have it. And this is the version that was shown at the New York Film Festival. Um, and um, Pauline Kael was preparing her review. She loved the movie. She was preparing her review. It opened about a week later, and she went to see it at, um, at the, uh, one of the theaters on 57th Street. Mm -hmm. And um, she saw that the film was not what she had seen at the festival. It had a completely different ending. I don't, I don't even know what that other ending was. I don't think it ended with uh, the wedding. The wedding, no wedding. Yeah. And uh, so sh Pauline Kael went public with this outrageous thing, uh, as far as she was concerned, that the studio changed the picture. She, I got a phone call and said, is this, a, is this your work? And I was like, what? They, I didn't even know that had happened. So Paramount. You mean they didn't tell you anything about the change? Uh, no. No, I, was, I got fired off of this movie, and then, and then some directors called Freddie Fields up and, and said, you can't do that. You know, no one will want to work with you. And I got, this is in post-production. There's all kinds of stuff. He just wanted to change everything. He took out, they took out all the shots of Bruce McGill in the scene when, oh, Bruce McGill, that's his first movie, by the way. So, we, you know, the, these brothers. So um, in, in, uh, in the scene where, um, where Paul goes to his house and calls him out, and he's wearing, that t he's wearing a T-shirt, and Freddie Fields, in his desperate desire to have an impact on this film, would have screenings in his Beverly Hills mansion night after night after night and have you know, all the, the, the superstars and celebrities come over. And one night I came into the cutting room to find our, our editor, John Link, bless his heart, removing all the shots of Bruce McGill um, in the T-shirt in that scene, trying to find a way to present that scene without it because Tony Curtis had seen the movie at Freddie Fields' house the night before and thought it was disgusting to see that guy's nipple. <laughs> so, did you know that? You heard no. it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> By the way, that, that's, I don't know, did, did anyone recognize Tony Curtis's voice in the opening sound <laughs> montage? Yeah. Um, so, now again, the way we shot it, because we showed, shot it the old-fashioned way, they had to put the shots in. They took them out, and then they had to put them back in. So many things were being changed. Um, <laughs> but then, then, then the, so they restored um, the ending. So the release version quickly became what we saw. Like Paul said, like I said previously, nobody came to see this movie, Citizens Band. Nobody came. Um, so, but by now the reviews were terrific, and and the people at Paramount could you know thought it was good. So um, one of the what, what was happening while they're trying to figure everything out is one of the um, the big wonderful amazing distributors in New York, Don Rugoff, said, "I love this picture so much. What it needs is word of mouth. Um, it needs people to see it, to spread the word, so they understand it's not they don't." Don't, don't, don't not see it because it's about CB. At the end of the day, that's irrelevant. So he showed the movie for free at the Waverly Cinema, which is now the IFC, for a week. And it was packed. Every day, every night, it was packed. And audiences clapped at the end of it, and, oh, like that. And then they, they started charging, and nobody came. <laughs> So, so blah, 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 you know. <laughs> but guess what, Freddie Fields? Uh, so here we are in 2012, and Paul and Matt's at Lincoln Center at the Walter Reed Theater, and we're still looking at it. So I think it's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Bravo, dude. <laughs>
Thanks. Can I ask another question? Could you talk a little bit about working with Jordan Cronin with? He's a oh, cinematographer yeah. I really love, and just what was it like working with him on this? I liked working with him. He was an artist, just like Jonathan, so I like working with artists. You know, he, he was looking up and staring at the walls, and I thought, what the hell is he doing? Is he, th is he with us or not? And then it turns out he was looking at the lighting and looking at the effects he had to reproduce as the day went on, like that. Jordy, um, for me to work with, was, was fantastic. I'd worked with some excellent camera people on the Corman movies, young, coming up people. Caleb Chanel shot part of one of them. And, and uh, it, we, we had good, uh, good looks, but now here's Jordan Cronenweth, who had shot a, a movie called Play It As It Lays. I don't, did anyone ever see that? It's a fan fantastic, gorgeous, gorgeous film. And he's the one that I wanted to get for this movie. Um, so Jordy liked the script, and he came on board. And um, he was an amazing, like Paul said, an artist. And such an artist that sometimes the, um, you know, like the getting the, the day's work done wasn't as important as making the image as powerful and beautiful as it ought to be, as it could be. And um, there was one night, um, that it's a night when, when I think it's Pam comes out and visits you, at the, at the uh, a candy comes out and visits you. But Jordy, we he was setting up an outside shot and um, by the way, I had a great assistant uh, director on that uh, who later became producer on, on all of Larry Kasdan's movie, mm -hmm. Charlie Oaken, a brilliant AD um, who, who taught me so much. Uh, and I'd say like, because I, I still didn't, I really didn't know what I was doing by the time, even though I'd done some movies already. He's being humble. He knew what he was doing. Well, I, I mean, he probably picked up things as time went by. Well, but before this, he did a movie, <coughs> Fighting Mad, with Peter Fonda, and you can see in that movie the elements that he incorporated into uh, Citizens Band. You know, the small town, the kind of interesting characters that are a little strange, and the tension that can exist between the characters. He brought all that out in his next movie. And I wish I had watched uh, that movie before Citizens Band because Peter Fonda was good in it. Yeah. He was good in it. He, he was uh, a little tougher than I played uh, Blaine. <laughs> And I wish I'd played Blaine a little tougher, but that's the way it goes. I'm glad you didn't. Oh, uh, we Thank like you. your softness. But, but Charlie was great. I'd say to him, because honestly, you know, I, 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 what they say when you go to, when you learn, when you direct for Roger Corman, and you haven't been to film school as I had not, um, you know, you're conducting your education in public, and you're at every single moment learning, learning, learning. So the curve was, was happening, but I still was key vacuums in, in my knowledge about direct. So I would say that I'd have a good idea, but I didn't know how to, how to, how to like um, tell everybody how to get it. And on the Corman movies, which she shot in three weeks, it was like, it, it, you're, you're just like, everybody's like, bap, 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 anyway. So um, I, I know there was a moment at the end of the movie when, when Charlie Oaken would, would came to me for the scene with all the vehicles going by. There's a wonderful shot there with, where, where one vehicle leads to another and it's all synchronized. And, and Charlie sa uh, would, he came over and said, so Jonathan, what do you want to do here? And I, I said, I said, well, I'm and I was trying to design the shot in my head. I was like, well, I, I think maybe the, it should start on, on, on the priest car, and then that could somehow bring us, like, and then I, like this, and he goes like, Jonathan, are you saying that you want to do one continuous shot that c transfers from vehicle to vehicle in synchronization with what they're saying? And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. He says, well, well, let me set it up, and you come back and take a look at it, and, and I'm like, okay. And he, he used to tell me, like, like I would say give some kind of like, like non-answer answer, answer to some question that Charlie had, and he'd say, would you explain that to me like a three-year-old? Because I didn't understand a word you just said. So he's always calling me out. So this night we're doing the scene out at, at, um, at uh, Blaine's farm, and Jordan's there um, setting up shot, and he's like, okay, Gary, he'd say to the, the gaffer, Gary, put those Swedish filters in. And he go look with his little black ring thing they have, and he go like, which one's that? Gary said, Swedish. Okay, take it out and put the French in. It changes. Hmm. Which one's this? French. Okay, take it out and put the Swedish in. Like this, he go, he's like, 
<laughs> like this. And at a certain point, I know that Charlie Oaken, just, I don't know if you remember this, like, Jesus Christ, Jordan, French, Swedish, whatever it is, make a choice. We got to shoot this. The sun's going to come up in five minutes. Uh, so <laughs> it was, <laughs> and he was always, you know, his, his work, like the greatest of cinematographers, trended towards. He played, he flirted with darkness in the image. That's why when we did those additional scenes in the woods, I don't even know why we did them, they, they had a new cameraman come in um, who lit everything up more. And uh, did anybody see the, the grip stand handle in the woods scene at the end? <laughs> Nobody saw it? You, you saw it. Good, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, did anybody see the, the two guys playing the guitar in the background when, when Paul goes to see Candy Clark and you can't hear anything? Anybody notice that? Yeah. That, 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 what they played was supposed to score the whole scene and deliver to the next scene, but Freddie Fields thought it was too confusing <laughs> to hear the guitar music, so that came out at the mix. Oh yeah, that guitar music is very confusing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. Freddie, bless his heart, you know, he, he produced our movie for us, you know, but, but he, he, I'm telling you, this was, this was the old style stuff, you know, at the mix on that movie where I got fired for wasting time by trying to get the guitar music in and what have you, just finally, you know, get out of here, you're fired, you know, so I left. But, but before, the, when I came back and started watching it, I had to be very careful about what I said, you know, <laughs> like this, and there'd be like a massage table, you know, like a mixing s stages, I'm sure many of you have, have been on them, you know what they're like, you know, there's a screen, the mixing board is back there, like this, Freddie, bless his heart, he's out there on a massage table in front of the screen. <laughs> Teams of masseuses, like, and I'm sitting there like, and sometimes I begged for a sound effect, or I begged for, there were, there were things in there, and then there's, there's crazy stuff. So it was quite an experience, and response, that's a long-winded response to your. Yeah, he, Jonathan can talk, all right? <laughs> By the way, about your acceptance speech at the Oscars. Oh, no, no, that's, no, forget that. Um, he won Oscar, you know. Um, so, uh, what was I going to say? Oh, but you didn't have any of these troubles on Melvin and Howard, right? No. You know, nobody interfered with you. By then, they, they, you know, they were with him. Until it came time to release it, right? Oh. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah. The, the, um, anybody seen Melvin and Howard? So you know what it's, it's like. Thank you. Um, so so this, this was a script that came to, to um, Tom Mount, who was the head of, young head of, of production. He was our agent. He was a fantastic guy. And he was, he was the one that was pushing pictures into production. And um, he had read this article in the newspaper one day about, um, no, his friend Don Phillips, who was our producer, had read the article, a little tiny thing that just said, Will found da 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 da. And Tom Mount got the money to have Universal commission the writing of the script, and they chose Bo Goldman. Mike Nichols was going to be the original director of that movie. And they developed the script, and because the script was so fantastic, even though it was a very offbeat story, like, like um, this movie is so offbeat, Citizens Van, my God, it seemed normal to me at the time. <laughs> now, uh, mm. So we made Melvin and Howard exactly the way we wanted to. It was not an expensive movie. This, w this, was low this movie, Citizens Van, was low budget. Melvin and Howard was quite low budget. And we made it, and it, it, it did, it, that thing happened where we had a fabulous script and we wound up with a fabulous movie. Mm. And we showed it to Tom Mount, and he adored it. And he said, I've got to screen this immediately for Bob Wilkinson, the head of, of distribution here at Universal. I'm like, great. So we, we, the next day, we have a screening for Bob Wilkinson, who's an older guy. He was older than us. Um, he's probably our age now. And he's, he's watching watch the movie, and, and Don Phillips, Art Linson, our producers, myself, and Tom Mount. And the lights come up, and Bob Wilkinson looks at Tom, our boss, the head of production, and said, this was such a, a, a lesson, and says, um, um, okay, let's go back to my office, fellas. So we go now to 
Bob Wilkinson's office, the, the head of the vice president in charge of, of distribution. So we go in there and we sit down and he gets behind his desk and that, it was so weird seeing Tom Mount like sitting in little chairs like the rest of us and now that's Bob Wilkinson was giant sales desk back there. And he leans across the desk, I don't know if you knew this or not, he leans across the desk and, they and he says, Tom, it's a nice picture. And I'm going to tell you the same thing I told you when I read the script. You're pissing in the wind if you think anyone's going to come see this thing. <laughs> and it was a staggering moment. And of course, the film went on to, you know, be the opening night presentation at the New York Film Festival. 1980. Triumphant reception. Uh, Melvin Dumar himself joined us in the box. It was, <laughs> it was uh, extraordinary. Um, yeah, I remember that. And Jason was sitting next to me. Yeah. And we were watching the movie, and he leans over, and he goes, well, I don't we'll use the F word, but he said, look at those two effing crazy guys, <laughs> meaning me and him. And I resented that. I thought, well, wait a minute now. I, I wasn't one of the crazy guys out there in the desert. But okay, Jason, whatever you say. <laughs> but yeah, the, the, the critics loved it, and it won a national... Award, what was that? The National Critics Award. It's got so many, the New York yeah. Critics and the yeah. Austrian nominations and this one thing and another. And yeah. it, it did okay business. It sure did a lot better than Citizens Band, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but that was like, 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 like such a giant leap in awareness on my part. I, I never, again, like I say, I was learning every day. I never understood that it's really the distribution arm of a studio that has the power. You know, they're gonna say, okay, you can make this one. And that's, I think that that's probably, you know, increased and, and become now, it's like everybody's distribution and nobody's production anymore. You know, it's kind of almost like that. He said cynically on the stage <laughs> at <laughs> let's Walter Reed The time we have left, let's get some uh, questions from folks here. Yes, sir. Can you talk about the well the two screenwriters, Paul Brickman and Bo Goldman? What was it like working with each? Well, I don't know. I didn't work much with them because you know the script was finished, and I would think the same thing with Jonathan, unless there was some there was some tweaking to be done. Um, I have to be honest in response to that question. It was great working with Bo Goldman, um, and it was great working with a Bo Goldman whose hand had been guided to a significant degree by Mike Nichols. Um, we had a lovely, lovely experience on Melvin and Howard. Paul Brickman, um, who was so aghast at this Roger Corman director being hired to direct his masterpiece, um, he was like, he was, he was even younger than we were at that time, and he just, just was, oh man, he just thought, of it. I, I looked one day at the list of 22, the, fil the script had been submitted to 22 directors before they finally sent it to me. And they sent it to me because, because yes, it's true, because Freddie Field's um, girlfriend, Sheree Latimer, had liked Fighting Mad that Paul mentioned and recommended me, and in desperation, they offered me the gig. S so Paul Brickman was very clear in his disdain for me, and he was also the associate producer of the movie, and we went up to um, oh. Marysville, and Does that mean he actually had something, or is that just an honorific they gave him? Well, it can be anything. Associate producer could be anything. It's, it's often the hardest working person on the, on the production team. In this case, it was Paul's deal had, and you know, Freddie wanted to work with him more. So Paul came up to location in the role of associate producer to, to just damage control. Within the first day, he was, uh, um, and, and Wedgworth came over and said, Jonathan, was that last scene we did okay? And I was like, yeah, it was at the Chinese restaurant scene. I said, you kidding, it was fantastic. He said, oh, because Paul wanted to know whose idea it was to, to say it that way and this, that, and I, I'm, I'm confused and like this. And so I went to Ben Chapman, who was our, our production manager, this veteran production manager. He had been the head of production at Republic Studios. And uh, I, tell, I, I appealed to him, and I said, I said, Ben, I don't know what to do. I'm really furious because Paul Brickman is going now to the actors and, 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 and saying he didn't like it. And, it's, and he said, well, um, I think you should throw his ass out of town. 
And I was like, can I do that? And he said, you give me the word, he'll be on the next Greyhound out of here. Yeah, I remember this now. A after right. the fact, that's right. And uh, I just thought, well, they had a conflict, and Paul's gone, and Jonathan is here. I think Paul should have been a director, and then he did direct later, and yeah, risky did a good, good did a great job, job with that. So, so he couldn't control himself, you know, for his idea from with his ideas, and he was infringing on Jonathan's world. And he never said anything to me, by the way, because I think. You know, he'd already tried that. But he did one, one th as a matter of fact, he did say one thing to me. He walked up to me uh, between, a take, between takes, but he didn't say anything about my performance. He said, do you like the color of the car, you know, the Nomad? And I said, yeah, I know. And I said, yeah, yeah, it's appropriate. And he said, I don't think it's the right color. He, Are you sure about that? And I thought... Well, I yeah, it's appropriate. It's what do you want? You know, he wanted to be more flashy, yeah. and I thought, well, <clears throat> I don't think that's right. You know, I did a, a car movie with a red hot rod, Aloha Bobby and Rose, the name of it. Little picture and called Aloha Bobby and yeah, Rose, right? And we, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the car because it was supposed to be part of the flashy, exciting thing in the movie. You know, on Sunset Boulevard and racing on uh, in cruising and stuff so that was appropriate but I thought that was a perfect color you know it's well Paul was on a learning curve too and and I wasn't the good guy and he wasn't the bad guy we just were coming from two you know places that were in ir irreconcilable and uh, when uh, so I said okay Ben throw him out of town and um, about an hour later Paul came up to me Paul. Rickman and said Ben talked to me, and I'm really sorry. I understand now that I shouldn't be saying stuff to the actors, and I give you my word that um, I won't interfere anymore. And I said, Paul, I'm really sorry, but you gotta go. You gotta go. Um, I just, you know, it just, you know, when you're directing something, you know, you, you've got to you try your hardest to make things work the best, and the whole your community is formed on both sides of the cameras, you know, we're all working together, and to have, have that kind of discord, even in the scowly thing, if he's not saying anything, so, so I thought that was like, I couldn't believe I was d had done something so mean, but I understood that I w also was being as professional and as mm, grown up as I had been so far on a movie set to, to go with that, and things went really well after that. Did he ever say anything about the final product? Oh, yeah, we never made up. You know, we never became friends. He never embraced the movie. Um, we got, you know, <laughs> the good news was Paul wasn't there for me. The, the bad news was we were getting these notes every day now. You know, and he'd look at Daly's and unleash these notes, and he, anyway. So the experience was yeah, not good. Yeah, for but us. the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but the movie. I can't wait to see this on YouTube, sorry. <laughs> Oh yeah, the movie was got on a lot of ten best lists. I don't know if they do that anymore, but in those days they were really popular, and uh, it got on ten best lists. So I think it was successful uh, artistically and creatively, and the uh, reviewers liked it. And in fact, the, you know, the Washington Post critic Gary Arnold is his name, and I remember this because he put it on back to back ten best lists. He he liked the movie that much that the next year he cheated somebody out of their spot and gave it on, on, put on his next year's 10 best list and he put in a note in there and said he just thought this film needed more recognition than it had had and I thought that's quite flattering. Speaking of, of Washington and, and, and Gary Arnold, um, there was the, the best review that that picture ever got that I've ever heard for anything I've ever been connected with. Um, I got a phone call saying, you know, go to DC because Candy Clark's friends with somebody who's um, connected with in Jimmy Carter's administration, and they want to see the movie at the White House. So I got down to Washington. Um, I was a big Jimmy Carter fan then, uh, from the moment he pardoned the draft Dodgers who went to Canada without anyone asking him to. 
Um, I was on his side. I, I still have tremendous respect for him. Anyway, um, I was very excited to go down there, and we, we went down um, and, uh, and watched the movie, met, met President Carter and uh, Rosalind and, and Brzezinski and everybody and all these, that guy, the, the general with the satchel handcuffed to him, that <laughs> thing like that, of thing, and, and senators and congressmen, and, uh, the screen, and everybody got a glass of white wine, and then the screening, um, the lights go down, and um, the, um, the, the director gets to sit in a chair next to Jimmy Carter. So I'm sitting in my overstuffed chair next to him like this, where he's right there. And at, and at a certain point, I see Amy uh, T. Carter's daughter's like, she's starting to fidget around back there and stretch and stuff. I think she was like 12, and I'm like, oh my God. So, so at a certain point, she's getting up and she's coming by my chair or something like that. And I know I, I, I grabbed her because the plane scene was about to come. And I was like, I was, I was convinced if she saw the plane scene, she would fall in love with the movie. So I said, go sit down, something's in Like this movie goes, it's over, lights come up. President Carter looks over at me, goes, well, that's America. Uh. I, I was like, oh, oh my God. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> hey, I have a Jimmy Carter story that you don't know about. I happen to ha have had a friend on the inside of the White House uh, circle, and he was a big shot in uh, Massachusetts, and Lester Hyman was his name. I knew him for years, and I asked him when Melvin Howard was being uh, screened in the film festival, I said, could you get on the inside and invite Rosalind and Jimmy to the uh, festival? And he said, yeah, I'll do that. But they didn't come, so I, my inside work didn't work out too well. I love they were invited, though. Yeah, they were. <laughs> <laughs> yes, No, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's another Ben Chapman around, Chaplin, Chaplin around, who is actually his grandson, I think, Charlie Chaplin's grandson. Right. Ooh. Actor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, th uh, thank you. And Roger Corman got an honorary Academy Award two years ago. Um, so, but, and I really agree with you about that. What yes, sir. His, his body of work, it was a Lifetime Achievement Award. Yes, sir. Could you talk a little bit about what you were saying before about the really was sort of a natural and this movie though it seems like it's a little um, uh, unnatural but not quite like the James Bond I was supposed to see it. It seems a little stiffer than it would have normally be. Well, it was about working with Candy Clark. It was a different role for her, I think, than she was used to. But um, I don't know. Just didn't it didn't work as well and she she, uh, I don't know if this is an insight into her performance, but she has said to me that she thought the characters in the movie were too quirky for her uh, sensibility. Candy thought, uh, Candy did a uh, working actress, and Candy wanted very much to work with Paul again. They had like landed together in American Graffiti. And Candy was always, to me, very, very candid about the fact she thought uh, the part of Pam was underwritten. And um, still, I was thrilled to have her. She accepted the part, and I was thrilled to have her in it. Um, and I know there was one night, again, I think it's the night she comes out to visit, where um, they told me that Candy wanted to talk to me um, in the trailer. Well, <laughs> Jordan was outside with the Swedish and the French. So I went in. and. Candy said, Jonathan, I, I, I don't know how to play this scene. This scene, who is this girl? She said, I don't know how to play this scene. I don't know why she would come out here at night like this. I don't know why she would say these things. I don't even know why she's still living in that dipshit town. 
And, and with each of these things Candy was telling me, I'm reali realizing how under-equipped in a certain vein I am as a director, because I, I guess you know, directors should be able to say, well, listen, da -da. and I was just like, gee whiz. I'm just saying, George, Charlie Oaken has just chewed Jordy out for that stuff, and the sun's coming like this, and I just didn't know what the heck to say, and I, I just said, you know, let's go out um, and try it, and um, if there's something you don't want to say, say something different, but let's go out and start filming and, and do it, so she, and she did. But I think that's probably it. She just was, was convinced that, that there could have been more f there for her to work with. Yes. Good question. Where was the film filmed? What town? Mm -mm. Oh, where we filmed it, Marysville and Yuba City, two cities, very uh, little towns near each other, in California. Where it was supposed to be, I don't know. Yeah, it was anywhere USA. But yeah, and and the Marysville, Yuba City, very near Sacramento in Northern California, and uh, it was it was great up there. It was great up it there. It was great working there. Yeah. And there was a smoky haze in the air some days. Do you remember that? I think they were, it was farm country. They were burning something. I don't know what, any farmers? I don't know what you're <laughs> supposed to burn, but they were burning things. We, we, we tried to cast, uh, we had to cast some of the parts up there for budgetary reasons. And that wonderful lady who is telling her life story and stuff, um, there was nothing scripted for her. And uh, we, were, we, we put out a call for interesting people who <laughs> might want to be in the film. And if, especially if you're interested in, in CB radio. And I remember she came in and just started talking about this amazing life she had had. So she was in, you know. I said, I see, I that's the way he is. He sees something he likes and he goes with it. And, you know, the, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Oh, um, I remember, uh, you know, Charles Napier uh, played the trucker and uh, Chrome Angel was his, I don't know what his, I didn't see the movie just now, so I forgot what his real name was supposed to be. But uh, he had muscles, and I thought, when I first met him, I didn't know who he was. I thought, oh, Jonathan has hired a trucker to play this part because he had the accent down and everything. And uh, so that well, he didn't respond to your request for interesting people, right? right. That one, no. The, uh, uh, Chuck was a Russ Myers superstar. Yeah, I found that out later. I hadn't, you know, I was innocent. I hadn't seen Russ Myers' movies. <laughs> now I have. <laughs> And she just passed away. Yeah. Charles yeah. Napier. Oh, I loved him. I loved working with him. We, he, uh, we stayed in the same, uh, the Bonanza Inn, was it called? Yeah, yeah. And he would sit out on, by the pool and he'd say, I got to get rid of my prison pallor. Is that the right, how you pronounce it? Yeah. Prison pallor. And I thought, my God, the guy's been in prison. <laughs> but that's the type of, he just said things like that. No, Chuck was a, was a fascinating, you know, amazing guy and a, a wonderful actor, and it was, was so sad when he passed away recently. I, I worked with him at six or seven times, and I was never able to provide as good a part as the one in Citizens Band. And he played like a hairdresser in Married to the Mob. Um, in, in, um, <laughs> in Melvin and Howard, um, it's, uh, it chucks the one that comes yeah. and gives Paul the will. The at will. The gas station. Yeah, that's a pivotal part. Yeah. And that was based on a character. I did some reading about that. You know, the more I read about this uh, will and the controversy about it, the more I tend to believe it's uh, true. And this guy, his code name was Ventura, and he came forward after the. Well, they haven't seen the movie, so I don't want to say too much. But he came forward and he said that he had gotten this package from. Howard Hughes, and that he was a special courier for Howard Hughes. And some of the people in Howard Hughes', Hughes uh, organization knew him. They didn't like him because Howard Hughes used him for things that he didn't want to ask just anybody to do. And that he had this envelope, and he said he was supposed to keep it. Howard Hughes told him to keep it. I don't know if you know this. Uh, he told him to keep this envelope until he heard that he, is, that he died, and then he was supposed to open it up. And he did, he opened it up, and he found this will and a letter and a bunch of money, $100 bills, and a note telling him, um, deliver this will to so-and-so and mail this letter to so-and-so, and the money's for you for doing this job. And he went and deposited the money, and then he took the will, which is the scene that you're talking about that Charles Napier played. And, and later, <coughs> he came forward, there's a trial, 
and he gave a deposition uh, under oath that this was true, that he did deliver this will because the, the, the authorities, rightly so, I think, uh, were rather skeptical of Melvin's story. And, but he backed him up. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, that uh, th also the, the fact that um, it was, I, th I think this guy, I, d I didn't know as much as, as that, which is an amazing story, but I, one thing I'd heard was that this guy, was Ventura? Mm -hmm. That he was Howard Hughes's guy and Summa Corporation didn't like him. He would, he would do things outside of Summa. Mm -hmm. And of course, it was, it's implicit in, in the Howard Hughes will, the Melvin Dumar will, that Summa is dissolved. That's where all the fortune went to all these other places, including Melvin Dumore. And uh, uh, so that was, that was kind of part of the thing. We filmed, if, if you see the movie, um, it's uh, uh, the, the credits, the opening credits are in Howard Hughes's handwriting. And um, the courtroom that we uh, have, the, there's a trial scene. And that's the courtroom where the trial happened, where Melvin was, was put on the stand. The, uh, Dabney Coleman plays the judge. and. What he says in our movie is exactly what, uh, what he says to Paul in the movie is exactly what the real judge said to Melvin Dumar at the time of this hearing, and the real judge was in the courtroom. He agreed to be uh, in the shot with the original stenographers. We, ha we, we duplicated the, that reality quite a bit, and uh, I asked the judge, because um, uh, uh, he was skeptical. Don't spoil the movie now for some No, <laughs> no, no, this, this doesn't spoil I mean, that, that there's this contested will, yeah. surely. But no, I, I asked the judge if I could talk to him for a minute, and he said, sure. And we went into his, his chambers, and I said, do you think there's any possibility, and I know what you said, um, and I know that it was thrown out. You know, he, he, this, this, this will was thrown out. I said, do you think there's any chance that that um, could conceivably have been the, the real thing? And he, he said, I'll tell you two things. One is that, um, if it was a forgery, and he said, this is what haunted me in reaching my judgment. If it was a forgery, um, it was the longest forgery in the history of forgeries, because it wasn't, the, it was a handwritten will. It wasn't just signing Howard Hughes' name that the calligraphers said yes or no. Whoever, you know, the Boy Scouts of America was one of the beneficiaries. That's a complicated issue right there. There were a um, lot of beneficiaries. But the, so everybody was hiring these lawyers. So he said, you know, that, that's an extraordinary act of forgery to do an entire five-page handwritten will. The other thing is that it was hard not to believe Melvin Dumar. The facts were against it. But so, so he was like, he was like, after all those years, he, he just, he wasn't saying, oh, no, absolutely. So I like to think it was real. Uh, I wasn't sure at the time. But since that time, I met someone who uh, worked on the new Candid Camera. Have you heard of it? It was, it was on about 10 years ago. And he said um, that he was on the crew for the new Candid Camera, and they were filming a, a, an episode, segment, at the Dunes or the Sands. I forget which of the... Anyway, there's a hotel in the... Beginning, right? Where I take, Melvin takes Howard Hughes to this whole dunes, but it's not the desert inn, which is where Howard Hughes lived. And um, the police had uh, scoffed at Melvin, apparently, that he would lie and not even know the right hotel in his lie when he told his story that he had dropped off Howard Hughes behind the hotel. They thought, you know, you're a jerk. You know, we can't, this isn't even the hotel he lived in. You didn't take him there. And Melvin insisted, I don't care what you say. That's where I took him. He wanted to go there, and he wanted to go in the back of the hotel. Now, this guy from the Candid Camera Show said when they were just filming this, I'll make this quick, because I know there are other questions. He said that um, the manager of the hotel, and this just happened, you know, five years ago or something, took us in the back to show us the secret hideaway that Howard Hughes had arranged to keep there behind that hotel, the Dunes Hotel, or the Sands, whatever it was, that no one was supposed to know about, just him and the owner of the hotel. And the, he, it's still there, apparently, and kept in the way that Howard Hughes kept it. And that 
he used to come there when he wanted to get away from the corporation. Mm -hmm. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and you will too after you see the film. Uh, before we go, because we do have to set oh, One up more question. Show. One more question? Okay, this gentleman over here on this side. Well, when we show Stop Making Sense, we'll, we'll bring Jonathan back. The big suit was, uh, he asked a, a, a fashion designer, um, he said, I, I want, I want my, my head to look little when I'm um, uh, performing uh, a couple of songs at the end. How should, how should I do that? And the guy drew the big suit on a cocktail napkin at the bar, and that's, that's how that happened. Wow. <laughs> but I was going to ask you, Jonathan, before you appeared in the New York Film Festival as a filmmaker in 1977 with, you know, Handle with Care, Citizens Band, uh, you also worked at the New York Film Festival years before, and you told me a, a great story before, and I'm wondering if you would relate that to the audience of when you worked at the festival as a publicist. Yeah, well, I, I worked for Pathé Contemporary Films, and uh, uh, they distributed like, like several of the new Godard films and stuff. And Richard, I don't remember what I told you. There were so <laughs> many things going in those, uh, on in those collections. What about stuff. Truffaut? Oh, oh, Truffaut, okay. Well, th yeah, that, that was, um, uh, yes. Okay, the very, very quickly, because I know thing. But uh, I was working as a publicist for United Artists. This is before I, uh, this was after my little tenure at Pathé Contemporary. And tr uh, Francois Truffaut was coming to town. Um, to publicize The Bride Wore Black. And I was an insane Truffaut fan. I was like just, you know, everybody in New York, you know, everyone who was a publicist, um, we, we were all just obsessed when we all knew each other. And just like, like so Truffaut's coming. I work at UA. I volunteer to pick him up. And um, I uh, went out to the airport to meet him. Um, I couldn't find my Truffaut button, so I wore my Jean-Luc Godard button <laughs> instead, <laughs> which Truffaut was like, what? No, qu'est-ce que c'est? So <laughs> he didn't speak much. He, didn't, he chose not to speak too much English. He's probably a little shy. His English was pr got better over the course of the five days that, that I took him around all these interviews. Um, but um, he, uh, he was terrific. I, when, when I picked him up at the airport and took him to the Algonquin, Algonquin Hotel, as I'm ushering him up, I'm like 22 years old or something like that, and he, God has landed, and I'm ushering him up, to the to the uh, registration desk, and before anything happens, the guy behind the desk at, at the Algonquin, which is such a great place, you know, looks at uh, looks up and goes, "Oh, Monsieur Truffaut, welcome. Uh, Signor Rossellini left this note for you." <laughs> and I was like, handwritten. For and I was like, "Oh my God, this was pre eBay, or I would have like, you know, like." <laughs> so um, so. So anyway, I sh took him around, and I tried to. Um, uh, uh, Bride Wore Black was based on a novel by Cornell Woolrich, William Irish, who wrote so many fantastic um, uh, stories that were turned into great films by you know Hitchcock and there's many of them. And I found out that that Cornell Woolrich was living in New York, um, in residence at the Sheraton Russell Hotel, which is no longer there on Park Avenue. So I thought, oh my God, I've I've got to you know, the, again the the buff in me. It's like the, uh, pretending to like do a thorough job here. I'm like, ah, I, I can meet Cornell. R so I, I called up, got put through to him, explained to him that Francois Truffaut had made a film of The Bride Wore Black, he's coming to town soon, and I would love to arrange a screening um, of, of the film. And Cornell Woolrich told me on the phone, he said, he said you know, um, uh, one of my legs was amputated um, uh, you know, about 10 years ago. I don't really go out very much. I'm not so sure. And I said, I'll send a car for you um, with a team of people. That would be me and, you know, another crazy young publicist named Paul Wolf. You know, and we'll send people to help you get there and then the elevator up to the thing like this. And he says, okay, okay. I mean, he gave me a time that he would screen it. It was about a week later. So I show up with Paul Wolf and with the, the, the special car and um, with, with a backup wheelchair just in case. And... Um, call him up on the house phone, it rings and rings and rings and rings and rings, there's no answer. So I said to the guy at the front desk, excuse me, I said, we're, we're here to pick up Mr. Woolrich because this, a screening has been arranged for him. And he said, oh, Mr. Woolrich never goes out. Um, and I said, well, well, he must be out because he's not picking up his phone. He said, no, he's not picking up his phone because he's not picking up his phone. And um, I was like, can I just go up? Maybe he's not like this. So I went up to his room and I banged <laughs> on the door. Mr. Woolrich, like this, <laughs> nothing, nothing. 
So anyway, I told Francois Truffaut this story, um, and he was amused and intrigued and everything by that, as he would be. So anyway, now it's time to take him to the airport. So we're on the way to the airport, and I brought my Truffaut Hitchcock book, which is the film buff's ultimate Bible, <laughs> certainly in, in those times, and I think to this day. Um, and I said, would you autograph you know, my Truffaut Hitchcock book for me? And he says, no. Oh. So he takes it, and he writes this thing in it. And um, I open up, I take a look at it, and it says, poor John Demi avec uh, mes amitiés and before your first film, Francois Truffaut. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. I said, but you know, I don't, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not interested um, in, in directing. And, and, and he, was, he was like, yes, you are. <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I was like, well, thanks anyway. You know, like, thank you. <laughs> so then in 1977, Citizens Band gets invited to the New York Film Festival. And I look at what else is there. Francois Truffaut's The Green Room is on the lineup, and I went, oh my God, now I've got an excuse to call Truffaut, I could, like this, and I called him up, with echoes of the, of the Cornell Woolrich story, and the phone was answered by Helen Scott, who was um, Truffaut's everything, and bodyguard, and everything, and um, I asked if I could speak to him, and she said, well, he's resting uh, now, why, why, why do you want to speak with him? And I said, well, I'm a director, and and I told her a quick version of what I've just said here, and she said, okay, well, I, his schedule's pretty busy, and we'll try to get back to you. And I said, well, can, I'll just punch in again tomorrow. She said, no, 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 don't, don't, no, no, we'll, we'll, I'll try to, we'll try to get back to you. So I never, you know, got to have that savory moment of saying, you wrote that, <laughs> and now I'm in the festival with you, <laughs> like that. Um, so that was, that was that. So Great story. <laughs> Jonathan, Paul, thank you so much for coming. Thank you very thank much. Thank you.